The broadcast is live. That's always exciting. There's always a bit of trepidation, a little bit of nervousness, even though I've done this 5,000 times over the past 13 years. Before I go any further, um, somebody hit me in the chat and let me know that you can hear me. Otherwise, I'll just be talking to myself, which is what I do for most of the day anyway. But um, please tell me that you can hear me, somebody. Everyone's talking about their portfolios they created in the, in the, um, okay. Daryl says, yes, we hear you. Um, what, what I love so far looking at the chat is that people are talking about the books that they have made since the beginning of this class, which is the idea people have, um, have taken it and run with it, which is pretty, pretty fantastic. That was the goal. A couple of, um, a couple of housekeeping items that I need to go over first before we get back to you guys dominating in the chat. Enrollees will receive their $60 off code. This is point number one, by the way. Enrollees will receive their $60 off code and a link to the class survey within 48 hours of the class wrap up. This will come from events at blurb.com. And since this is our first ever blurb course, yes, believe it or not, our first ever blurb course, we'd love uh, your feedback via the survey for future programming. So a bunch of you have said in here um, qu some quite interesting comments in here about what you'd like to see in the future. So don't be shy. And also point number two, we want to see your portfolio. These things that you're talking about in the chat that you've already made, tag us on social at blurb books or email us at partners at blurb.com so we can show off your work. Um, how cool would that be is if you take this course and get your, get your work shown off. And lastly, classes will be live on demand via the link for one week. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll move to our YouTube channel where you can see them afterwards. Gloria said she made a magazine and a trade book and a photo book with different series. So Gloria, you get the gold star. That is a, that's called going above and beyond. Okay, so what's on tap tonight? On tap tonight is we're going to have a little presentation here. It's not going to be as long as some of the others. I'm going to cut it short because a couple of reasons. One, I can see by the chat that everyone is off to the races here. Make sure that you are putting your questions into the chat because we are going to have a little bit more time tonight for questions. There have been so many questions that have come in. I thank, thank all of you for doing that. I thank everybody for being here in the first place. And also thanks to Jackie and Noel who are on the blurb team behind the scenes. You can't see them, but they're the ones producing this whole event. And we've also got a guest lecturer tonight. That is someone who is unique in my experience of being around the photography world for 30 plus years. She is a dynamo, to say the least, and I want to make sure that we give her enough time and also uh, give you all enough time to ask her a lot of questions because I have a sinking suspicion she's going to blow your mind. And so uh, that is the uh, that's the plan. And I'm going to run you through. So I'm going to give the prezo. Then I'm going to run you through something that I built over the last day or so, which is a very bizarre publication. But I think uh, there's a reason why I built it. And I think there might be something in there that will resonate with some of you out there. So I am going to go ahead and start this. Uh, I love it. Okay, hang on here. Share screen. Yes, 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 yes. I'm going to share a window. I'm going to share this window. Okay, my peeps. Can everybody see this bright yellow presentation? Don't ask me why I did a bright yellow presentation. I'm having a little water, getting warmed up here. I got a good sweat going. Just kidding. Although I am in New York and it's pretty humid. Um, okay, everybody can see this. This is the third installment of our class, third and final installment. I'm kind of sad, actually, that um, this is not going to be happening again next week. Someone said it's orange. It is. It's kind of a middle. It's kind of a cross between orange and yellow. I want to remind everybody here with the first slide, portfolio, photography portfolio is a collection of work that illustrates who you are as a photographer or artist, designer, illustrator, writer, storyteller. It doesn't really matter what kind of work you're producing. Uh, building a portfolio uh, basically contains a lot of the same building blocks uh, that you would use, regardless of whether or not your photography is your primary pursuit. The first thing I'm going to do is start here with a couple of Q&A. We did this last week, and I think it was successful. There were a couple of things that were pending last week that I didn't get to. And I think it's good to like get you guys warmed up for, the, for the, uh, the chat. This was a question that was asked in the first class that I promised I was going to answer. And then I didn't answer it. And um, hang on. Someone's saying, I have video and sound. Everybody can hear me, right? 
Someone say, has it started? I see the chat, but no video. Hopefully you can see my yellow presentation. I know that some of you can. Maybe you have to turn on your, um, your camera. Who knows? Keep trying, Susan. Okay. This was a question that was asked. Can you transfer a design from one format to another? Yes, you actually can. And this is what it looks like. When you're in the Blurb Bookwrite software, if you go up to the drop-down menu at the top and where it says papers and format, and you drop down, it will say convert book and gives you all the options in terms of what you are going to convert your existing book into. Hopefully you can see this presentation and not just hear me. Um, that would be, uh, yes, we can hear you. Yes, 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 we can see this. So anyway, that's how you convert a book. Now here is my personal bit of advice. Just understand something that if you are designing a five by eight trade book and you think that you're going to convert that into an 11 by 13 photo book, I think you're asking a bit too much of the software. What I would do is I would consider the aspect ratio. If you're building a, let's say you're building a six by nine trade book and you want to go to an eight by 10 photo book in the portrait format. So not landscape, but portrait. So you're keeping the aspect ratio. That to me is a doable thing. But if you're trying to go from one extreme to another, I just I think you're asking a bit much of the software. And here is the other secret ingredient here. And I'm just I'm you're going to thank me for this at some point in your life. You're going to think back and you're going to think warm and happy thoughts about me, because if you're doing this, let's say that you can uh, you want to do two formats, six by nine trade in magazine. So you've got a six by nine and an eight and a half by eleven. You want to build the smaller book first. Don't build the magazine first, build whatever the smaller version of your project is, build it first because the software seems to like going from small to large better than it does by going large to small. Now, the, the, the other reality is it, you're going to have to tweak it a little bit. It's not going to be that every single page is absolutely perfect. You may have to go in and make some slight movements on things, but it works incredibly well. I was suspicious. I thought there's no possible way this is going to work. There's too many moving parts. It works. The blurb, uh, the blurb coders and software people, um, they're incredible. Okay, question number two. I shoot multiple genres. Should I create a portfolio for each? This is a great question and something that I have been thinking about for 30 plus years. My short answer is yes. I do love creating a portfolio that, you know, for me, I was a portrait photographer and I also shot documentary work. So I had a portfolio for each. And if you're shooting, you know, reportage and documentary and portraiture and something else, whatever, editorial, it is a blast to have a portfolio for each because then you have a little set of portfolios that you can then target to specific clients. However, in my opinion, there is also something to be said for what I would call the masterwork, the masterpiece, which is understanding the connection between all of the kinds of work that you do. And this is where a picture editor, somebody that's a full-time picture editor or a book consultant or somebody like Sibylla, who we're going to be talking to later, somebody who can look at your work as an outsider and see the connections between all the different kinds of work that you do. The reason I'm telling you that is that this happened to me probably a decade ago. I was showing my work to a gallerist in LA. I showed her five different stories at one time. They were actually laid out on the floor of a hotel room. And she walked in and didn't say anything for 10 minutes. And I thought, oh, she's definitely not into my work. And I was kind of nervous. And then she pointed at a single picture from all five stories and said, that's your story. And I said, no, 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 wait, you're looking at five different stories. And she laughed and said, yeah, I know you've probably never seen your work this way, but this is the connection that runs through your work. So my advice is to do both. Build a portfolio for each and then look for the master class uh, as we go further on. Last question in the intro here. I'm thinking of starting a monthly magazine. Do you suggest eight and a half by 11 or six by nine? I know you're thinking this is not a trick question, but it is a trick question because why would you not do both? This is my magazine series called Essay. And I publish in, of all things, the person who asked this question, I don't know if you knew this, but I publish in six by nine trade and I publish in eight and a half by 11. It's the same story, the same work, Everything, the design, everything is, is exactly the same, but there are two different objects. And for example, the magazine has coated stock. The paper is coated, which means it's a little punchier. It has a little bit more color, a little bit more contrast. It's bigger. 
And the six by nine trade book has uncoated paper and it's smaller. It's a different experience. And I'll, I'll tell you that right now, the response is running about 50, 50. When photographers get these in their hands, <clears throat> I would say that 50% choose the trade book and 50% choose the magazine. So there's no right and wrong here, but if you can do both, why not? And as what I, what I told you a minute ago, um, start with the small one and then move to the large one. Okay, now what? You've come to this class, you've been dazzled by my presentation and my personality for the, I don't know, four hours now. I don't know, maybe dazzle is, a, is the wrong word, but here I am. So now what are we gonna do? Let's recap a bit. What we're talking about here when we're talking about portfolios is print. Yes, you can do a digital portfolio and I highly recommend that. It's a great companion piece to a print piece and vice versa. But we're talking about why print. And printing forces you to apply critical thought to your work in a way that's different from the digital space. There is a penalty in the print space for leaving things in because you have to pay. You have to actually pay. And everybody that's been in this chat so far that's talking about, I made a trade book, I made a, you know, someone's talking, David's talking about he's buying a, a calibrator for his monitor. All of these things in the back of your head make you question everything that you're doing with a printed piece because there's a dollar sign attached. That's not a negative. That's actually a good thing. And so critical thought, which arguably is lacking a little bit in our world today, but this is one of the, the best things about it. And I told you about reviewing portfolios and having someone walk up with a printed piece as opposed to someone walking up with, a, with an iPad makes a huge difference. The portfolio is also tangible and tactile. It's physical. You can handle it. If you walk up to a reviewer and they have a cell phone in their hand, and who knows, they're on TikTok making a viral video, and you hand them something physical, that phone needs to be put down and they have to confront this object, which is a great thing. Remember, undivided attention is what we're after with a portfolio. It is to the point where print this printed piece that you're doing in some twisted way has become confrontational because we have to disengage with everything else and engage with this physical object that's put in our hands. Isn't it amazing that we're talking about this print in this way in 20, 2023, how much our culture and society has changed? It's fascinating, but it's um, very poignant when it comes to making something in print. And, and the last one is that it's lasting. This thing is going to be around forever. So I'll tell you a quick story. I went to New York. I was a, I was a photographer. I was photographing commercially photographing kids. So I would shoot portraits and then that work was syndicated and sold around the world. I went to New York as a photographer with a, with a portfolio to show my work. I had a box of prints, but I also had this little seven by seven blurb book, one copy that I had made for myself. And I was like, I was just experimenting with blurb at the time. This was like 2006 or seven. And I was, I just had it for myself. It wasn't a quote finished product or finished portfolio. But as I was showing the box of prints, the person who was looking at my work, my portfolio, looked down into my bag and saw the little book and said, what is that? And I said, oh, it's nothing. It's, it's nothing. It's just a test. I'm thinking. And she was like, let me see it. And so I gave it to her and she looked at it and she looked about third of the way through it. She closed it, put it on the table and said, hang on a second. I'll be right back. And she left. And when she came back, there were 13 different magazines in the same building. And I only had a meeting with one of them. And she came back with the other 12 photo editors and they all gathered around and looked at that seven by seven blur book and said, OK, now we know like who you are and what you're doing. And so when I went back to California, where I was living at the time, I printed about 15 copies and I sent each one of those editors a copy of that book. And here's the important part. Ten years later, I went back to that same agency and my books were still there. 10 years. They last. There is no Instagram post that somebody's going to dig up 10 years from now. It'll be on there somewhere, but nobody's going to go back through it is my guess. So tangible and lasting. Okay. Let's recap the steps. What you're going to do with your portfolio. And I know that some of you are already made, made the leap and you've already made your books and that's fantastic. And again, remember, send those into blurb. We want to see them, but you're going to, first thing you're going to do when you get to this process is think about your budget. How much money do I have and how much do I want to spend on this? The second question is, what's the quantity? Am I just making one for myself? Am I making one big book to show at, at portfolio reviews? Or do I need to make 
a bunch of these? Do I need to make a smaller book that's less expensive, but I can build more of them for the same budget? Third, you work back from the budget to find the materials that best fit the kind of portfolio you want to make. So does that mean a big lay flat photo book that's 200 bucks? Or does that mean, uh, you know, a $7 trade book? And those materials will lead you to what book fits that price point. By the way, I did not mention this before, but Blurb has a pricing calculator on the website, which is fantastic. It's a little bit buried. It's a little hard to find, but it's in there. Look for the pricing calculator. You punch in, um, you punch in the materials and what you want, and it'll show you what the cost per unit is. Next, you are going to edit. And I tell you, last class when I mentioned how many images I shot in Albania and how many I ended up with in the final portfolio and how many of you commented on, you got to be kidding me. People have reached out to me through email and through Discord saying, are you kidding me that you, you, know, you, you, edit, you shot that many pictures and only ended up with 12? Yes, that when it comes to a portfolio, if you're doing a straight classic style portfolio, which is what I showed you last time from my work in Sicily, we looked at that por por portfolio, it was probably 40 pages. There might have been 20 images in that, 25 images total. That's the kind of editing that you have to, you have to do. The next thing is that sequence. I showed you some images last week of sequences that didn't work. What would happen if I got one picture in the wrong place and the sort of penalty that you can pay for the wrong sequence. So again, when we talk to Sibylla later, Sibylla is somebody who can look at edit and sequence as a professional and say, these are in the right order or not. So getting that second set of eyes. Then you're going to make a test. You're going to build a test book. And no, I, I don't want to hear any ex excuses as to why you're not going to make a test book. I've heard them all. I've heard every um, excuse in the world and you can't, none of them are valid. So make a test book. By the way, the test book is the fun part because remember, you're only printing one copy. No one is ever going to see it. I have made some test books that are putrid. They are so bad that I would be embarrassed if anyone, even if my mother saw them, my mother would say, dude, what's your problem? So make a test book and then learn from that test book, refine and repeat. And you're going to refine and repeat until you get it where you want. And, and again, when I say make a test book, that doesn't mean you print an 80 or a hundred dollar test book. That just means that you print something small to get your typography your typeface, your type size, your placement, your density, your, your images at the right density, the right color before you do the entire, then build your, your be all end all book. Uh, Kristen says, do you order the test book from blurb also? Yes. Yes, you do. You order, you, if you're going to build uh, whatever, let's say that you're going to use a magazine as your test, um, your test object, you could just print a default page size, 20 page magazine and get things where you want them and then build your 40 or 60 before you buy the full thing. And they, uh, Jackie just put the pricing calculator in the chat. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about story now, which is a bit, for those of you traditionalists out there, you classics out there, story and portfolio may not have been in the conversation together for a long time. Because when I was in college and I went to photo school, the portfolio was not really necessarily about telling a story. It was simply about showing the best images we had. They could have been 10 different images from 10 different stories that were a, a, an assortment of images that showed how skilled we were behind the camera. But as I mentioned in class one and two, we live in a very different world and we live in a world with a lot of good photographers. And to me, there is a balance today that didn't exist before, which is a balance between my story and the story I'm trying to tell. And that's where portfolios have really begun to diversify. And this is a really fun thing. The book I'm gonna show you in a minute is crazy. I would have never done this book 20 years ago, but I just had an experience that made me realize how important this was. So again, my story versus, or your story versus the story is a balance that you have to figure out. And a couple of people have already mentioned in the chat that they have been jumping between, um, you know, doing portfolios that are more than just straight images and leave clues. I'm going to show you something. I, I have a, a, a technical way of leaving a clue that is gonna be very interesting. And also you kind of want, I, I told you this before, what's the Einstein quote? Somebody hit me with the Einstein quote in the chat. I'll give you three seconds to hit me with the Einstein quote. Da, da, 
da, da, da, da, da, da. Somebody's going to remember it. If you don't, all right, we ran out of time. The most beautiful thing in the world is the mysterious. That's what you want to air towards. Mystery is beautiful. Laverne got it. You win the gold star. Okay. Let's talk about brand. When you're building your portfolio, there's a couple of essential things you've got to have in there. And I don't want to hear um, excuses on these either because I told you last time how many jobs, how many photographers have missed jobs from me because they don't have any contact information. Do not leave your Instagram handle only. I'll find you. You want to brand with material and color amongst other things, which I'm going to list here in a second, but materials and colors. Look at this presentation tonight. This looks completely and utterly different from the first two presentations. If when this is over, there's a black gold star that's on there, be, uh, black star, because I just had a conversation with a friend of mine who worked for Black Star Agency, and I thought it was hilarious. I heard, hadn't heard that in a while. I thought I'm going to build that into my presentation. But your materials and your colors are going to identify you as a brand. Your logo, if you don't have a logo, it's not a big deal. Get one made or make one yourself. I, I suggest working with someone who knows how to build a logo. Um, the logo is a wonderful way of branding yourself. Your telephone number needs to be on there. Um, again, there are a lot of clients out there, a lot of really good clients who are not going to go to social media. They do not leave a digital trail of where they're moving. And so you've got to have your telephone number and you've got to have an email. An email's really good. Got to have it. And remember, people spend 10 times the amount of time on their email than they do with social I know that uh, that sounds sounds nuts today, but it's true. And they're 10 times more likely to engage than they are through social. And your website. A website is should not be considered a drag. A website is a blast. It is your online ecosystem. A newsletter. I just wrote a post for blog, uh, Blurb that I uploaded today, which is about the power of the email newsletter. This is a, a very important part of your branding. You can link to it, and I'll give you a little twist on this in a minute. Then put your social media on there as well. Absolutely. If you have Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or Twitter or all the above, feel free. Because all of these things present your ecosystem. The more control that you have over your marketing and branding ecosystem, the better chance you have at a long form career. Anyone can get hot and be a flavor of the month over a short amount of time. Remember, I'm 54 years old. I lived through the era of cross-processing in the film world. I lived in Los Angeles one of the fashion capitals of the United States. And I saw cross-processing film photographers go from the stratosphere to the dumpster in a 12-month span because the fad wore off. And that's all they had in their arsenal was cross-processing film. What you want is an ecosystem, and this is part of it. And your portfolio is a small part, small but important part of that ecosystem. Okay. The last thing I'll say about this is um, I wanted to re-emphasize this and collaborate. You are in a class of like-minded people. So I'm looking at Raverne and Rochelle and Sandy and Mikola and Kristen. You're all in here. These are your people. This and these people are your second set of eyes. So when you find yourself in a group like this, find a way to share contact information tell people about your site or whatever it is, and you can form a group behind the scenes from being in this class that can you can help each other. You can send portfolios to each other. And oh, by the way, in the Blurb software, you can export a small res PDF of the project before you, you, before you print it. And you can email that to a friend and say, tell me if I'm on the right page here. Tell me if these images look good. Tell me if the sequence looks right. That's, that's the thing. You don't have to live on the island unless you want to be on the island. Share and uh, get a second set of work. Okay, so what did I do? Let me tell you a quick story here. So I am in, currently sitting in New York. I'm not in the city. I'm on Long Island. And I left New Mexico a month or so ago, a month and a half ago, and I drove across the country doing events. And right before I left the house, I grabbed all my blur book samples that I normally travel with. And I only took a small amount because I'm traveling and living in a van. So I took like eight books. And at the last second, I decided to throw in a journal that I had made from last year's trip to Albania, which is this weird thing. It started as a blurb journal, but then it was modified after the fact. Don't know why I put it in because normally my journals are for me. They're not for you. I wouldn't typically show this to anyone, but I thought, I don't know, I don't know why. I'm just going to put this in there. I threw it in. 
And this, what these next few slides are what we're going to look at, and they're gonna, we're going to look at the digital one I built from this year. But this started as a 8x10 blurb notebook and journal, which is, again, in the blurb side, it's under its own tab in, in terms of the under the product tab, notebooks and journals. It's all the way over to the right. And this started as a simple thing, and then it was modified after the fact. So the little Polaroid that you see in the front is a Fuji Instax that was glued onto the cover. And that's um, red acrylic paint in the upper right. And then that image is a multiple exposure. So what you're looking at is some of these pages, some of the pages itself was printed into the notebook through Blurb, but the rest of it was applied by me after the fact. So Sandy asked, is the notebook and journal a blank book? Only if you want it to be blank, Sandy. So I didn't want mine to be blank. This image that you see on this page was an image I shot in Albania that I loaded into the Blurb software. The image is printed onto the page, but all of the text that you see was applied by me after the fact, after I had the book at my house. It's all done by hand with pens and ink and everything else. So I'm modifying. This is a, a, an image that I shot in Albania, but the text on the right-hand side is a white gel pen that I've written over the image in, um, after the fact, after I got the book. And the, the text on the, on the left page and the left side of the right page that's etched. So I took a, a sharp pointed object and I etched my text in. I actually scraped the image off the page to make that writing. And then I take pens and I do outlining. This is a way that helps me draw when I'm, when I'm drawing and I don't have an image. This is a way of reminding myself how to do that. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this is that I took this book to these events as I drove across the country. And the events had a range of people, consumers, prosumers. And then I did a couple of events that were almost entirely high level professionals, both in photography, art, design, illustration, small groups, all high level. And every single one of those people, when they went to my sample books, came up to me sometime in the night with this book in their hand. And they said, this is all I want to do. This is the book. This is the one. So again, these are pretty simple modifications on some of the pages. This is a postcard that somebody sent me. I just glued it in. I did a little pen work on that image, but pretty basic. Some of these are just text over the top of an, of an image. Um, but this is really fun. This is really, not only is it fun, it was very strategic. And after the response to this book, over the course of this past month, I was like, oh, this to me is a really interesting way to present work as a potential one version of a portfolio. Um, by the way, these are all the, these are dot grid pages, which you can do in the Blurb software. And each of the grid intersections is color coded with a drop of ink. So this is not, these are not blank pages. Do you realize how long this took me? And by the way, the ink is all in a specific pattern. So again, I, this was literally torturing myself to do this page. I, halfway through, I was like, why did I decide to do this? But it's very interesting. And when you see it in person um, it, and you move the, move the journal from side to side and up and down, it has a weird wave of color that, that happens with it. Um, so that is uh, the end of this presentation. So I'm going to jump out of here and then we're going to go in and I'm going to show you what I built with this journal in mind, something I just built, which is um, a little different. Okay, I'm going to go here. I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to share the entire screen. And I'm going to go here. Okay, let me just move this over so I can. Now, can people see this book? Tell me you can see this book. Can you see my blurb software? Anyone? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Alex says yes, but who else? Okay, cool. Lots of yeses. Good to see. Okay. With that last journal book in mind, I showed you some of this work last week, which was the work from this year's trip to Albania. And I wanted to, this is not a portfolio for public consumption. This is a portfolio slash journal for me that I am using as, wait for it, wait for it, my test book, my test book. I told you there's only 12 images from this year's trip that work. 12 out of 1,947, there's 12. But remember, I have work from 2022 and 2019 from the same story. 
So I probably have 40 images, maybe close to 50 images over three years that I have to build a classic portfolio from this work, which I will because the work is very odd, as we've seen. It's multiple exposure work. And some of these images require study. Like you can look at the same image for an extended period of time because there's so many things happening in the same image. So a classic portfolio will emerge from this work. However, I don't have time to build that right now and I wanna make sure it's, it's done well. And so what I had time to do in the interim was build something weird, which is what I'm doing because Einstein was my co-pilot. So we're looking at the cover here. And the cover is that same cover image I showed last time. But I've just done a little Albania journal here on the right with, um, you know, a little white background. I've used the shape tool here, the shape tool here, et cetera, just repeated some of the patterns on the back cover. And remember, everything you're looking at will be modified after the fact. So this will not just look like this forever. I'll be using ink and acrylic and oil paint and tape and all kinds of other things to modify this cover. Then I have my, the first the first page of my book. I have a little um, you know little funky multiple versions of photographs that are a little bit blurry as a as a sort of a a tribute to the fact that I shot multiple exposures, many of which look the same way. This, for example, is one of those images to me. I'm I'm starting this with a simple straight multiple exposure that I think is representative of the work that I made while I was there. Even though there, there's no people in this one, this is more of a landscape. I'm definitely not a landscape photographer. I'm a people photographer. But um, this is an image that you can look at for a while. And it's something also, too, that if a person opens this from the front and not the back, as we talked about last time, they're going to see an image that I think is representative of the work as a whole. And then what I've done is just give myself space to play. So this is a quote. Um, that I love. And this is something that I ran into when I first decided to go to Albania in 2019. I realized that Americans had no idea where Albania was. They thought Albania was Russia. They were worried that I was going to get killed in the war in Ukraine. They had no idea where it was. And I thought this is hilarious. And this is part of this was this would be something that would actually make my portfolio when I edit this body of work into a portfolio, this will make it. This quote, Albania is not in Russia, will be there. But what else is on the page here, people? Remember when I talked earlier tonight about leaving clues? What else is on here? Yes, yes, yes. There is a, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. Oh, you guys are chatting amongst yourselves. I love this. There's like a whole parallel presentation happening here. Yeah, QR code. Steve hit it. There's a QR code. The QR code links to my newsletter on my website. So putting, I, I've, I'm starting to see this more and more again, which is fantastic because we went away from QR codes for so long thinking they weren't cool or they weren't useful, but they really are. So I've Q, QR coded the front of this where somebody can just pass it over. It takes you to my email newsletter. You can sign up for my email newsletter. That's a whole nother separate story. If I have time at the end, remind me to tell you about my newsletter. It's hilarious because there is no newsletter, but there will be, I promise. Albania is not in Russia. And again, this whole right-hand page, this whole page is for me to work over with subsequent materials. Again, then I bounce in and out with just showing straight images. And again, there is nothing sacred in here. There will be ink and arts, art supplies and oil paint or whatever over the top of this. And then with the blurb journal, I'm building this exactly how I want. So I'm just adding grid pages, grid spot pages, blank pages, line pages. I can mix and match page by page by page. It doesn't matter. It's anything that you can dream up. This book can have that inside. I'm also working a lot with the shape tools. And the shape tools to me initially were a total gimmick. I was like, why would I ever use a shape tool in a book? And then I just went back through my photo books collection. And I have a pretty decent sized collection. I was amazed how many different times uh, shapes were utilized in these books. And I was like, okay, I need to rethink this a little bit. So the reason I'm using the shape tools is I can then put other colored materials over the top of that black. So I can use white gel over the top and it just offsets the look of the entire page. Now, remember, this is not a straight portfolio. The straight portfolio has yet to be built. This is my fun experiment book before I build the straight portfolio. And remember, I can build a straight portfolio with this same work and, and build it into the notebook form and I can use the notebook as a leave behind. If I built 10 of these in eight by 10 and made a trip to New York, or I would probably go six by nine, 
I do six by nine. I go to New York. I meet with 10 different people. I could leave one of these behind, one for each of those people. They're very affordable and they look cool and they're funky. And I can almost guarantee that nobody else is going to give them something like this. Again, I'm just mixing and matching straight imagery with weird multiple exposures. And a lot of these images are not good enough to make a final portfolio, but they're fun in a journal. And they remind me of what it was like to be in these places at this time. Again, look at this page. I got spot grid on the left and I got full grid on the right. And I'm bouncing with quotes here. There's no Russian money. We have our own oligarchs. This was, a, this was a quote I loved. There's a lot of money laundering in this part of the world, not just in Albania, but pretty much all over the region. And everyone assumes that it's always Russian money. And my Albanian friend was like, no, 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 no. We have our own oligarchs. And I just loved that quote. I want that in there. Another straight image from the multiple exposure side. Another bouncing around and working with uh, the shape tools. This is kind of a hack that I found. In the Blurb software, this right-hand page is a solid color that I've then clicked on and sent to the back. How you can do that in the software. Whoops, I can do this, and then I can bring it forward, and it turns into a solid color. But when I send it back, it turns into this weird line for some reason, and then I, my shape tool comes through. I've never seen this before, but I liked it. It was kind of a cool hack that I like. And again, I'm just looking at this page as an overall design piece that I can then modify after the fact. I can work with it after the fact. I already have an idea of what I'm going to do here on this page. Uh, again, running um, black text over a dark image may not be this uh, very difficult to read. I would not do this in a, in a, in a tra traditional straight portfolio, but if I outline these letters with a white gel pen, it's going to look awesome portrait again a hack the tool to get those lines that's not an ottoman bridge that's albanian there's a lot of sensitivity in albania about the ottoman period um there was a rough time for albanians and so i was going to visit an uh what, what i was what was described to me as an ottoman bridge and the driver that i was with said no 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 it's not a that's not ottoman that's albanian very sensitive topic again straight imagery i'm just bouncing through this pretty pretty fast that's a quote from the guy in the fish markets that all the big fish are gone which is pretty symbolic of most of the most of the planet these days um, again just really mixing and matching and having fun here with weird type pages i don't care if it's hard to read again the only person who's really going to see this until it's done is me again that's a hack on the on the tool straight imagery that's the, the former dictator and Berhoja. Uh, lots of undeveloped buildings in Albania. Again, just playing with like placement of these small hacks just for fun. We sell Rocky. Rocky is the um, sort of national drink of Albania. Um, and again, doing the same thing here. I used a color and then hacked it with the moving the front to back to get these lines. And then just, again, this is just pure pure playing here. I'm not taking this too seriously, although I know that within this body of work, there's a portfolio that at some point I will need to um, address, if you will. I will no longer be able to hide from the fact that I've not built a portfolio from this work. But you know what? I'm a busy guy. I've got stuff going on. And this is not uh, super critical to my, to my life at this point. But if I was going to show this work, it would be. Who doesn't love the shape tool? Another multiple exposure. Again, I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, this is the backside of the dictator's house, which is just a almost regular house that sits in the middle of the capital city. There's no, there's a fence around it, but other than that, there's nothing really keeping anyone from it. It's a bit of a surprise, but there it is. Um, and again, I'm just going to buzz through this, and I just want to show you one more thing at the end. I just added the QR code at the end for sport. Um, again, in case what we talked about last time, and I'm going to quit out of this. I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to stop the screen. And now you can just see my mug, and I'm going to take some questions here um, before we get to Sibylla. And I'm just going to do like five or 10 minutes of questions. So if Sibylla, if you want to get a drink of water, make a bathroom break, whatever, I will come back to you in about 10 minutes. We can go from there. And um, 
I've got some questions start up here from the blurb team. Uh, so let me go down here. We're going to do some of this. So that, um, remember, there's no reason to just do one thing. I think if you take the time, if you're dedicated, you take the time to do a project. And this doesn't have to be a project that's meant to build you fame and fortune. This could just be something that you care dearly about. And you take the time to put into it and you're new to the bookmaking process. You're new to the portfolio making process. There is no reason to think that the first time you sit down to do this, you're going to build something perfect. There is no such thing as a perfect book, number one. And number two, there's no reason to put that kind of pressure on yourself to build something that's perfect. Build something that's fun, that feels like you. Take your time with the materials and the typeface and the page design. Experiment, tinker, and refine over time. And then you'll start to see the ultimate uses for other kinds of portfolios. So for me, let's say that for some reason I wanted to work as a photographer again. And I was like, okay, I need to put something together that shows the kind of work that I'm working on now compared to what I did 15 years ago, which is very different. I would take that portfolio from Albania and I would build a straight portfolio. I would build probably like an eight by 10 soft cover portfolio with ProLine uncoated paper. That's a great combination. I love those that combination of materials. I love that price point. And I would have that in case I ran into somebody who I really wanted to work with <clears throat> or a photo editor or a client or <clears throat> brand or somebody, and I would have it. But I would also build some really small, inexpensive, informal portfolios as well. And then ultimately I would probably do a lay flat. I would probably spend some money and I would do a lay flat book. And I would leave that lay flat book in my office or on my coffee table at home, because I do have a lot of people over who are involved in the photo world, photo industry, gallerists and curators and that kind of thing. And who knows, who knows where that might lead. So let me get to some of these questions. Um, Kristen, I already, I already answered your uh, question about do you order the test book from Blurb? Yes, you do. You, you order it and go through BookRite exactly like you will with, um, with the rest of your books. You'll go there. And um, okay, the next question is, um, oh, this is a good question from Alex. For notebooks, how well does the paper respond to markers fountain pens, paint, et cetera? That's a great question. I'm hoping that it means that you're a journal maker as well. The paper that comes in the blurb notebooks, <clears throat> sorry, I'm choking up. I'm getting so emotional about this, I'm choking up. The paper that comes in the notebooks is awesome for materials. Now, the materials that I prefer the most are gel pens and acrylic paint because acrylic paint dries really fast. And I love it because it's vibrant and contrasty, but I can put a thick layer of acrylic on, leave the journal in the sun for 10 minutes, and it's completely dry. I love, 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 love oil paint, but it takes days to dry. And I just don't, you know, the wind blows the journal shut, the pages get stuck together. Gel pens look good. Um, I do use ink as well, but sometimes ink will do bleed through. But remember, bleed through can be part of the the work itself. So strategic bleed through through the paper actually looks really good. Okay. So David, uh, Alex had a second question. How do we share our portfolios with blurb mail in a copy or send in the digital file? So there was an email address. Let me pull that back up here. And I think, um, Jackie might have added this in already, but, um, so, um, partners at blurb.com is the email address that you want to use, partners at blurb.com. Okay, uh, let's see here. David Senhoff, I calibrated my monitor. It was shocking, I told you. You're sit you were probably sitting in front of a monitor that was green and you had no idea because this right here, this human eye is an incredible thing. The Spider software says that some print houses will provide ICC profiles for their paper. Does Blurb have an ICC profile available? They have one ICC profile available, um, but you have to know what you're getting into when you download it. Because what I don't want to happen is for the ICC profile to unravel you as a bookmaker, because you have to understand how that works and what it means. So a lot of times, and the reason I say that is a lot of times people will download the ICC profile 
and they'll see what it does to their images and they try to compensate and it gets goes down a rabbit hole. So case in point, I've done 330, let's say, publications with Blurb in the last 15 years. I've used the ICC profile twice. And the reason I don't use it, I'm not saying not to use it. The reason I don't use it is because oftentimes if I make a book and it looks really good, Sometimes photographers, my friends, they'll say, oh, you know, your book looks good because you got special treatment or you or you're some like you're some digital technology master or whatever. For those of you who know me, those of you who know me from my YouTube channel, you know that technological master and my name will never, ever, ever be together in the same sentence. So you don't have to use the ICC profile to get a beautiful book. That's my point. So but it's there if you want it, you can find it on the on the blurb site. Okay, here, a couple more. Uh, this is from Kristen regarding the question about multiple, whoa, hang on a sec. Hold the phone here, Chuck. Did I lose that one? I might've lost that one. Okay, lost that one. Uh, probably already answered. So um, let's see, we'll, we'll ask, what are the shape tool effects adding to your portfolio? So with a straight portfolio, what I showed you was on the second class, I showed you the Sicily portfolio. And that was a very straightforward classic portfolio where I had the word portfolio in four letters, P-O-R-T, and then spelled out. And the last letter on the left-hand page at the bottom was an O. And I drew a line between that O to my portrait, the author portrait of myself or the artist portrait, which was also in the shape form. So if you're using it as a design element, that's what it can add to your portfolio. The journal I just showed you, remember, was 100% about playing with the work in a fun way that allows me to live with that work for a while and really make the tough decisions about what's good and what's not good before I build the real, quote, real portfolio from that work. So the shape tool is not something you have to use, but it's there if you want it. And again, I've seen it used masterfully. I just looked at a three different copies, three different issues of a magazine from uh, Swarovski. I can never pronounce this word. Swarovski Optics, which are this, the binocular company out of Austria. They're the best binoculars in the world. They have a publication called Closer. It's beautiful, gorgeous publication. And whoever the designer is for that publication uses the shape tool incredibly well. I was so blown away. I got a million ideas from looking at it. So those are the kind of things I would use in a straight portfolio. Okay, um, uh, Alex, we got that one. Let's see here. Okay, Tim asked a good question. Books and mags are in, and this may be the last question here before we get to Sibylla. Books and mags are in portrait format. Uh, what is a good way to mix landscape format and go with the 12 by 12? So Tim, you have a couple of options. You can do an eight by 10 photo book, which is in landscape. Or you could do it a, um, a 12 by 12 if you wanted. It's a big square. Or you could do an 11 by 13, which is also a landscape aspect ratio photo book. But here's the thing. I think that's the low hanging fruit. If you want to do that, makes sense. 97% of all images are shot in landscape format. So it makes sense to have. The, that's why we have an 8 by 10 book and an 11 13 book to show that aspect ratio. However, if you look at the vast majority of photography books out there that are printed, many of them, even though they're mixing portrait vertical and horizontal imagery, they're often in portrait format. And to me, the master class of page design is working with something that's in port portrait aspect ratio with imagery that's both horizontal and vertical. So it's something maybe for your portfolio down the road, um, but maybe not something that you want to try right off the bat. So go with your 8 810 photo book or your 1114. Okay, so we are going to um, move on now because we have a special guest and I want to make sure that she has enough time and that we also have time for a Q&A at the end because let me tell you who we're about to bring on, you might switch to decaf right now because um, she's going to blow you away. So let's, um, let's see if we can get Sibylla in here and I'm going to give you a little introduction to her. And then I'm going to let her explain what she does and um, and what she's uh, what she's going to do. How about that? Let's see here. Hopefully, I don't have to do anything else here. Here we go. There you go. Hold the phone. Okay. 
this this is not even going to come close to doing you justice. But before I even start telling you who we're talking about here today, because I don't know, I've got I've got nineteen things listed for how you could, you could identify her. But every single person on this call needs to go to Sibylla's website when we'll get to that in a minute and read her CV because it's mind blowing. This, this CV is mind blowing. So I was, we were talking earlier before this call started and I said that um, I get a lot of people that reach out and they say, Oh, uh, you know, you got a lot going on. You do a podcast, you have a YouTube channel, all that, but I kind of have a lot going on, but you really have a lot going on and it's so well done. However, let's start with this. We are fortunate enough tonight to have Jay Sibylla Smith with us. She is an activist, a program director, a curator, a founder, a host, a traveler, an investigator, which might be a stretch, but there's a reason behind that, a connector of visual dots and patterns, which to me is one of the most important things that you do. You're a consultant, an educator, a designer, a reporter, as we've seen by your work covering Perry Photo. Uh, a writer, a podcaster, which we're going to talk about in a second, a book lover, obviously, an exuder of all things positive, which is one of the things I love most about you. And by the way, the owner and utilizer of some of the coolest boots I've ever seen on a, on a human being. Um, and so uh, welcome. Welcome to uh, Herb's Creative Pursuit class. Oh, my gosh. You crack me up. And decaf, I think they hopefully started with decaf because yeah, to keep yes. up with you and you're a hard act to follow. That was great. 19 identifiers. I, I, I finally decided I call myself a multi hyphenate. A multi hyphenate. I like it. There That's cool. I've never, I've never heard anyone use that before. So it's all yours. Thanks. It was the easiest way to describe it, but um, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm excited to jump in. And I also have some answers to some questions I saw, but I think that um, I'm going to get through my presentation and then very quickly give like five answers, like boom, boom, boom. Yes. To that, sounds, that sounds cool. good. Let so, me ask you one thing first, sure. which is how do you, when someone says I'm on a plane, we meet on a plane, you're sitting next to me. What do you do for a living? Oh, I knew. Dramatic pause. This is not easy. It is. I am not a sound bite. Um, I say that I work with artists to develop their concept okay. and that I work illustrating with fine art photography. I curate fine art photography. Sometimes I say just one or the other, but one leads to another. I, I always get, and I even got it today, um, uh, we had a tree fall down on my street and I had a whole host of uh, people out there from the fire department, etc. Anyway, uh, I said, yeah, I got to get out to go to my studio. And someone said, are you an artist? And I said, yes, because I am. You, I am. Um, you know, but really what I talk about is that other artists, their concept is my medium. My oh, medium is other people's work. So how, yeah, it's, and I find lots of different ways to describe as I go on. Um, yeah. But how do I pull up my presentation? Do I go to, oh, whoop, there it is. Voila. That's awesome. There you go. Wow. Okay. There's, there's a little bit of magic. I love backup like that. All right. I'm going to see. I have to, I'm doing my move it, but it's not moving. So hang on. Maybe arrow I have key. to click on mine. Yeah, no, I'm doing arrow key. It hmm. isn't moving. Um, let me look. I wonder if I have to press on my uh, little box that has it in there. Hmm. 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 That's a good hmm. question. It's not working on my end. So it's, um, so Let's what see. would the I could go, so you know how we see little boxes below the main screen. One is just my presentation. I could hit that, see if that moves anything. I can also move around and see where my keynote's huh. right here. Maybe you have to um, hit your share screen. Wait, let's see. Hang on. There you go. I know what I needed to do. I pulled up and lit up my... Um, my keynote. So anyway, here we go. All right. 
So what I wanted to do is begin with this image that is by a Ukrainian photographer. Her name is Yelena Yemchuk, and it is her um, from her book, Odessa, which was shortlisted for the Perry Photo Aperture Book Awards. And the reason I lead with this is because this is for my purposes, um, a great example of an impactful image. And that one of the things that I think is key as you edit and sequence is this idea that you investigate what makes an impactful image. And the real question is why. So when you are in, if you sit in front of a reviewer, ask them what is what are some of my most impactful images and let me know why. So I won't go into all the details here, but this has form, this has composition, it has mystery. There is a quality of almost, how did you make this picture when you talk about mystery? It's like this uninterrupted intimacy and how did the photographer do that? That's something that grabs you and that's important. Um, I wanted to talk about the art form of editing because it is an art form and the secondary one about sequencing. And I try to let people know one way to think about it is to look at your images and think of them like musical notes. I know that sounds odd, but you want to be able to have the uh, an ability to to find some of the characteristics of your images and then kind of put them into some groups such as that, because what you're ultimately doing in sequencing is it's like a musical score. You are actually going to have that kind of a flow. You need to have variety. You need to have pacing. You need to have pauses and crescendos. So that's what makes sequencing is that kind of of moving through, getting a sense of your images. Um, this is what I wanted to cover very, very quickly because honestly, I could do an entire program on each one of these uh, for at least an hour. So thinking about an impactful image, image and understand that not all your images are worthy and some of your images are on the way to the ultimate image. And you've got to educate your eye to be able to see that difference. Um, we're going to talk very quickly about how you see. Um, we're going to do something called punctum practice. And I'm going to introduce very quickly, literally a slide on concept aware, which is my framework that I created and also the um, foundation for the podcast that I've had that ultimately is uh, three years. And I'm going to leave- which by the way, is an unbelievable podcast for, for every, which is in, in transition, right? Naming is going to be. Yes, yes. Yes. It was one when you were on it and it's going to another and I'll explain that. And then some do's and don'ts for portfolio reviewing. And then I have a pile of leave behinds that will um, stop sharing and I'll just hold them up. Excellent. Um, yeah. That you can do that. So, this is a, a, a known photographer. This is an awesome quote by Joel Meyerowitz that the idea that the things you notice reflect the way the world speaks to you. No two people in the same place at the same time see the same thing. And everything about what I'm going to ask you to do is to get to know your unique voice. And what's really interesting is the answer is in the images. And it really has to do with being in conversation with your work. And if you get into the process, the product will take care of itself. And I think Dan is an excellent example of that. He goes into a playground. There's not this preciousness. And that level of experimenting and refinement is going to lead to stronger work. Um, one of the things that I like to say and talk about is who do you have to please with an image? And hopefully I'm looking at this, uh, if you wanted to throw in the chat your answers, who are you, who are you pleasing? Yeah, that's a really good question. Is it, is it yourself? Is it a photo editor? Is it uh, a camera club that you're a part of? Yes. Is it that trend you talked about before? Um, so 
Michaela yeah, says so myself. Exactly. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. You are the ultimate source of that. Do not go to Instagram and imagine that the likes are steering you in the right direction. You might ask an opinion, but it is not a barometer. You are the barometer. You and your work have an intimate relationship and it's actually your responsibility to get in there and be in conversation with it, listen to it, respond to it. Um, that's what I need. You know, I just can't emphasize that enough. So this is an example when I said, or Joel Meyerowitz and I'm quoting him that three the same people don't see the same thing. These are images by three different people of Yosemite Falls. Of course, on the on my screen left, Ansel Adams in 1946. Uh, two contemporary photographers, Catherine Opie in 2015 in the middle, and Bin Don 2016. They all do different things with it. They are all talking about different things, larger concepts with the same subject. So keep that in mind. You have a particular voice and that's what we need to hone in on. Hang on, I found out when I went over here, I lost my, this is tricky. It wants me to be on, so I can't read the chat and I'll read it after I finish because I can't keep going back. Yeah, um, no, I bring, okay. Okay, I bring in a word that most people don't understand. Currently, my podcast is called Got Punctum because I see it as essential to every impactful image. Roland Bart wrote about this in a very, very dense book, um, but really worth it, Camera Lucida. He was trying to talk about what is it about photography? What, what happens when we view an image and we're actually engaged in something? And he came up with the term, you receive punctum from an image. And he went on to talk about punctum for many, many pages in this book. And one of the quotes is that punctum is a thinking eye and it has the power of expansion. So I base my work on working with punctum. And my very basic description of it is that it is the wordless emotional impact of a photograph. And he used punctum because it's Latin for piercing. And he's really talking about what comes or jumps out of an image and pierces your heart. And one of the things to know about punctum is you as a photographer have absolutely zero control over creating that punctum because each of us comes to an image with our own experiences, our own memories, our own exposure. Things appear differently to each of us. And that is a really important thing to remember. And my premise, Concept Aware, is the basis for this, that I take Roland Bart one step further and I actually put the steering wheel in your hand. If you are engaged in punctum as you are creating the image, it will be embedded in that image. So that means your enthusiasm, your gut response, your yearning, emotion, question, mystery, whatever. But that, if you work to get that into your images, that will come out and that's how you get that circular relationship. That's, it's, a, it's a really interesting point because what I was saying about the balance between the classic portfolio and the story style portfolio that you can, you can do today with how much you actually want to share about yourself in comparison to just sharing the work, it's really interesting to think about that ideology happening before those images are made. If you can be involved in the punctum, that punctum then transfers through how that work is then seen and how it's presented all the way through the lifespan of that. That's a really interesting thing. I've never heard anyone really talk about that before. Yeah, well, that's actually the premise of my, my book and the framework, because I really believe in that. And what's really interesting, you are the conduit, you are a lens, and you have to get really clear on the lenses and filters that you bring to the work. And that when you enter into that conversation with your work, you get clarified it ends up showing in your work because your intention is clearer. And what's really interesting is that takes time to develop, but it is essential. It is just essential. And it's such a, um, 
it, it, uh, you're making me think of an analogy, which is hilarious, but I've been, I've taken yoga for decades and depending on when you go to a yoga class, I could be in the class and have been for 10 years. And one teacher says it a different way. And I'm like, oh my God, I get it. Right. Like it takes different ways to see things that actually pierce through. So think of yourself as an artist, that that's what you're doing get clear and you will pierce. Not everybody. That's not the point. The point is to get clear is for you. And then you will, you will, your audience will find you because your work is talking. Um, if that and makes do, sense. Do, do you think it's as simple as finding clarity on the project, the story that you actually want to tell? Because so many of like the folks that reach out to blurb or reach out to me on my YouTube channel, there are people who are, they want so desperately to do story, but they're not sure what that is. And they enter, go, they go into the world before that's been consolidated or solidified. And then they kind of drift from project to project, never finishing anything. So is one of the things that you're talking about literally just saying, okay, I think I have a, I can see the edges of this story now. Now I know what the purpose is in the field. Is it, is it that, or is it something else? It is a little bit of both of that, not to be confusing. It is letting the story lead you through your enthusiasm. I often talk about it like Hansel and Gretel. What are the the bites that get you excited and take you through? Okay. I had a great example of someone who sat through a workshop with me for a weekend, didn't take an implement. There wasn't a piece of paper or a computer on the guy's desk, which fascinates me because I can't I, I don't think or work like that. But for years, two years at least after, he kept saying to me whenever we ran into each other in other circumstances, he'd keep going like this, concept aware, concept aware, I'm still thinking about it, I'm still thinking about it. And then I had a Facebook group of people who had taken my workshop and he was very interested in um, gun violence. And he went to a uh, protest on gun violence and put on our group he put up portraits. I literally, he said, I went to this protest, really kept thinking um, concept aware, think I really finally got what I wanted. And he, and he put up this group of like five to eight portraits. I literally, A, cried, B, called him. And I'm like, what happened? Tell me what you did. And he, he told me two things. He said, <clears throat> excuse me, you gave me the confidence to like what I like. Mm. And I needed to simplify. And what he honed in on, he chose to, tr to, to use black and white. He chose to find people who had signage that responded to I could be next. Because uh -huh. that was the most poignant thing for him. So it's kind of like clarifying your intention. But stories evolve. And that's what you need. Like, I almost want to say we get in the way of ourselves because we get this idea then we get this product and then we aim for the product and I'm like that's not helpful let the idea cook unfold and follow it with your gut with your intention so I'm going to go through something super quick this go is ahead. called punctum practice let's see we have um, yeah we have time so I have a couple of images these are the rules I'm going to um, advance this and I'm going to give you literally 15 seconds to give me and you put it in the chat five words five you know connected words if you want them to be I want your emotional impact to the images I'm going to show you and um, and I'm pulling out my phone because I want to time it so that I give even time to these things. So hold on one second. I'm going to my stopwatch. Okay. So this is punctum practice. All right. Go. Okay, next. Next. 
super interesting. Sorry, I started reading and yeah. <laughs> let that one go longer. Here we go. Last one. Okay, so, so it's really interesting, and I'm going to just go back. Just want to give you a little background. Um, interesting to see the difference, and you can look at it in the, in the chat. Uh -huh. um, you know, someone can say one thing, uh, like right here, one is death and luring, and the other is empowerment same image, right? So what we're seeing, if you look at the chat, is all the different ways that we see. I okay. just want to give you a really quick rundown. This is Miska Droskowski. He lives in Brooklyn. This is the Gowanus Canal, and he is an outdoorsman living in a super fun site, and he photographs it at night. Um, this is part of that project. And what's really interesting, he has gone on to do a book about this, and he's done Awesome collaborations. So glad you brought that up, Dan, with um, conservant conservancies in Brooklyn. And he's become part of this humongous community of impacting not only the health of this Superfund site, but other recycling in, in Brooklyn. Super interesting image. A lot of people, I think when we got there, I'm not sure exactly all of the comments about it, but just to give you the background, a Utah-based photographer, Amy Jorgensen, she has innovated an emulsion that she puts on her body. She's really interested in what um, Walter Benjamin talks about as photography as um, evidence. And she's like, I'm collecting evidence of my being and my body. And this is a 10 year project called the Body Archives. Um, I've seen this beautifully, beautifully uh, printed in absolutely massive uh, uh, size in galleries. Um, this is Ada Mullane, uh, um, Ethiopian photographer, multimedia artist, activist, um, who uses herself, these are um, herself and other models, to basically be talking about levels of um, her own experience as a, uh, a, black, Ameri a black person 
and layering some of the things that are coded messages in terms of that noose, uh, in terms of watermelon. Um, she's talking about the face painting that she does is something that is done not only in Afri Africa, but if you look indigenously throughout the world. Um, and so trying to expand our understanding of coded messages that we see. This is John Stanmeyer. He is part of um, Seven Photo Group, V11. Uh, this one, the 2015 um, World P1. Press Photo. Oh, Sorry? yeah. World, yeah. Uh, World, Press, and, World yeah. Press Photo Image of the Year. If you go on um, V11, um, Seven's, uh, or, or World Press Photo, they interview everyone that they've honored and John Stanmeyer does a great job. So there's so many ways that you can learn from other people's websites about how they see. This image, just to tell you, he was in this country for three days. He was with a fixer. He didn't know how he was going to tell this story. He walked around for those three days. On the second day, he saw what he came upon here and came back the next day. These are two images that he took on film. This is one of them. Nobody moved. Nothing staged. These are migrants that are trying to get a signal to phone home. I can't tell you how many people think that this is an eclipse. It's not. Um, this again, um, lots of different things. Someone said Eastern Europe. It's actually uh, in Cuba, in Guantanamo Bay. It's on the base of Guantanamo Bay and unbelievable work being done by an investigative photojournalist, former lawyer, using art to activate how we look, see, investigate, think about things. She went to Guantanamo Bay, didn't know how she was going to follow the story. And when she got in the cab to say that's where she needed to go, the cab driver said, oh, the country club. She focused on areas in which it was the play that the people that were there had and the kind of pseudo country club that was available. This last but not least, this is Rania Matar. She's a Lebanese Palestinian American uh, who is cross culturally dealing with the fact that she left her country of origin as a late teen, came to the United States to study, never went back full time. And when she was raising her family here in the States and constantly going back to visit family, she was like, wait, these are like, some people are living in a war zone in Beirut at times in Lebanon. And these people that are living in the United States, not under those conditions, these 13 year old girls are really similar. And she started to follow that story. And one thing has led to another. This is her latest work that is called She. And this is really interesting because a lot of the people she's photographing who live in Lebanon are the age that she was when she left the country. So why I wanna bring you through that is just how expansive storytelling can be, as well as our response to it, as well as um, the fine art potential that also has an undercurrent of transformative justice, actually, with some of these issues, expanding our ideas on collective issues. So big um, piece of what I want you to just be thinking about. Um, concept aware, Another problem with not a sound bite. It is a concept development framework. I did initiate it, and that comes from my background, which is in a few different fields. Um, but what I'm trying to do here is give visual artists tools to bring their abstract ideas to fruition in impactful images and clearly written text. And I try to work when you go through a concept aware workshop, we talk about the lenses that we all have because I'm not gonna take away the fact that I am who I am, but the more awareness of where that impacts how I see, the clearer and more um, uh, consciously and informed from an informed perspective, can I tell the stories that I want to tell? Um, right. I think there's a word that you've used a few times that I think is incredibly poignant here that kind of gets overlooked. I'm going to turn on my little beauty lighting here, or maybe I you won't. Go for it. Well, go ahead. Um, what is that? Uh, not, not firing, not happening. Um, the word is impact. And I impact. think, mm -hmm. I think in essence, you know, the, uh, the importance of honing what it is that someone's produced, because the idea that you can toss something out into the world willy nilly, which is happening all day long at a volume level that we, the world has never seen before, 
-hmm. it's very unlikely that that is going to have an impact for everything that goes viral. There's tens of probably tens of billions of, of things that don't. So that refinement to me seems like an absolutely critical level, especially with anyone that has intention behind their work. Uh, there's people on the call here that I know are trying to build portfolios because they want to put those in front of clients. So that, you know, all of this, what you're talking about is really just built to better understand what it is and how to deliver it. Yes. And what's really interesting now that you tell me that about clients and um, uh, I would refer you to look up Sig Harvey, C-I-G oh, yeah. Harvey. Sig Harvey. Um, I have interviewed her on my podcast. So Sig really, she taught for a long time. She did a lot of editorial. She spent time focusing her work and I, she was deeply in conversation with her work. What ended up happening for her are two things, which everybody wants to have happen, but it doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't happen with a lot of work, which is that she honed her style. And then brands came and said, oh, could you do my branding through your style? So she did Kate Spade. She's done other, um, fashion houses, other entities, and yet she continued to explore on a fine art level. And she's on her third, she's had three books that have all sold through, and she's actually exhibited globally. So that is through that level of intentionality, refinement, uh, honing for impact. Her last book, when I talked to her on the um, podcast, is ironically the the it, it 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 part of the inspiration was a friend in a health crisis, and that she couldn't bring flowers to her friend, and that how do you bring beauty, and that that instituted or instigated a huge deep dive for her into this field guide on flowers. Amazing. Um, oh my goodness, look what happened. Um, I, um, <laughs> my podcast has been called Got Punctum. It literally started as a photo book book group. As you can see, this is like nothing. I have bookshelves, uh, I think, just in my vicinity. I have over 300 books. Um, and I have sourced them globally um, because it is a global visual culture conversation. The United States is a sliver of it. I saw that we had someone here from Rome. Fabulous. Like there's so many different conversations going on and I want to coalesce them. So I started or was going to start an in-studio photo book book group um, and it was literally going to start on March 12th, 2020 and my building was not open. And within mm -hmm. 10 days I went online and I grabbed a a photographer from the U.S. who had worked with a gallerist in the in Germany, and the work was on Afghanistan. And I got the three of us together, said, want to hop on and talk about this. And on our very first call, there was someone on from Namibia giving the photographer a opportunities to consider for showing in the Middle East. And I thought, I think I'm on to something. So now 70, you know, um, episodes later, this is what I do. I, I bring artists and photographers and critics and curators, and we talk visual culture. And I talk creative practice and pull apart the process. A lot of times it's around photo book making, but not always. And I want to share the ideas and the challenges and the resources. So we're up to 11,000 listeners in 64 countries. I'm looking forward to making that even a bigger reach. And um, we're going to consolidate and call it concept aware as we go uh, forward in the next season. Um, let me see, is that my last? It is. Oh, no. There we go. Glad I put it on there. Here's some quick do's and don'ts, because if you are in a portfolio review, um, you are in a situation of give and take. It takes a lot of courage to put your work in front of people. I say to everybody when I'm teaching or when I'm consulting, it, it, your creative process is a sacred space and I enter that honoring it and you want to honor it too. Um, it takes great courage to show up and share it. So not everyone's going to be as um, 
intentional about that. So there's a, a way in which you want to give and you want to take. It is a there is a differential power dynamic between sitting in front of a quote unquote expert, but you are the expert on your work. I still remember someone at Photo Lucida, I'm looking at her work and I'm able to stand up and I made some comment and she burst into tears and said, oh my God, you know my work better than I do. And I kind of cracked up and I said, no, I don't. I can just see it from a different space. You know your work but that's all about you getting in touch with it. So when you're sitting across the table for someone, make eye contact because some people you're, you're intimidated. It's, it's not easy, but it's important. You're a person, I'm a person, like make eye contact. If you want to record it, that really takes the pressure off of you of trying to remember everything. Because especially if you go to a portfolio re review, you usually meet with like six people in a few hours. And by the time you're finished, you don't even know your name, never mind what everybody said. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to take notes and think and move through. So ask to record. A lot of people say yes. Um, you want to meet with, here are my priorities. I'm looking for feedback, for guidance. I'm looking for resources. I'm looking for editing help or sequencing. I already told you, um, ask them, can you help me select my most impactful images and explain to me why you chose the ones you did? You can ask a person because everyone's individual, would you like to just look at my work and then we can talk about it? Or would you like a framing of my artist statement? Like it's a give and take, figure it out. Not everybody wants the same thing. Um, you can say, I'm looking for your recommendations. Like, do you know if there's other reviewers I should put this in front of or other galleries or other nonprofits or other spaces, places, groups that I could be um, you know, a part of or helped by. Um, somebody might be able to look at your work and say, you know, it'd be really helpful if you came in and gave us some still lifes. You've got a lot of portraits, but maybe we need a, a little bit of this. That goes back to that outside eye can help you see that when you're creating your composition, your sequence, what I talked about is kind of being a score, sometimes you need a palate cleanser. Your eye needs a rest. So that's helpful to get some ideas from people. Or they can say, you're heavily into here. Maybe we need to bring in some of this. Um, lastly, you ask them, can I contact and can I add you to my mailing list? all super important things to do. So I think that's my last piece. And let, I'm, me, I'm, let, let, let me ask you one thing. I'm, I'm sure. very curious about your, your opinion about this. So I yeah. only, I only do portfolio reviews <clears throat> a couple times a year. And that means, I don't mean showing my work. I mean, looking at uh, reviewing other people's work mm -hmm. and I try not to do that, but a couple times a year I get roped into doing it. And one of the things that I've found really interesting is when I sit down and someone walks up, could be with an iPad or could be with a box of prints, doesn't matter. And they just immediately start showing work. And I stop, I always stop and I say, okay, wait a minute. Number one, why are you sitting here? And number two, do you understand what it means to be a creative member of society? what that actually means, because the cr creative aspects of our culture, the creative industry mm -hmm. is a significant contributor to the GDP in pretty much <laughs> every country around the world. And being a part of the creative industry comes with a certain power that is a power that you have to understand and take advantage of without without being devious or trying to manipulate it. But it comes with an inherent power. Mm -hmm. And the last time I did this, uh, was it a, was it Catchlight Reviews in San Francisco? I love mm -hmm. Catchlight as an organization. Mm -hmm. And then it, when I got done with, with asking those questions, I would say, okay, do you want to go back to looking at the work now? And every single person said, no, I don't want to, I don't want you to look at my work now. I want to keep talking about this idea that as creatives were, we have a, an inherent power that's part of this bigger picture and where do creatives fit in society? And so my question, the long rambling question here is that first 30 seconds of that interview, being able to really concisely identify who you are, what the mission statement is for you as a creative, how important is that for you as a reviewer? It's important. Um, it's important to know that you are owning your power in this situation and that I am a collaborator. 
I always say I collaborate with my clients. I ride shotgun. Um, but where you are in your process, you know, I'm a beginner. This is my first portfolio review. Or um, being able to know what you know and know what you don't and concisely be able to say that, I think that's really important. Okay. Yeah, if that if that makes sense. Um, sure. And um, there's two things I wanted to do. I wanted to answer some questions and I wanted to show these. So I guess if you, oops, if you, um, uh, can you see me enough if I just hold stuff up like that? Oh, there we, yeah, go. Okay. there we go. So what I wanted to say is one of the nice things, I mean, if I do photo Lucida, I mean, I literally can see 50 people over, you know, a three day span or something like that. Like it just can get overwhelming in these big um, portfolio reviews. So we call these leave behinds and they're important and they're helpful. And I save the good ones. This is super simple, super simple card information on the back that gives me an image because sorry I will meet you I'll think you're lovely but I'm going to forget you and I'm going to remember your work and you'll come up to me the next time and go like hi and I'll be like if you just showed me a piece I'd like put all the pieces together my memory is with the work there's That's lots and lots of ways to really show. interesting yeah it is and it's crazy little... and it's kind of embarrassing but it's true to super little. This is a person um, who did uh, uh, Irish Travelers, book of his portraits on that. These get even more clever. Yep, you remember them. This is oh, a cool yeah. strip. And this this work, and this is a hedge that is the case holder, is important to the concept of the work. And then it's just an accordion in there. Right? Love that. That's Love accordion really, books. That's really nice. This is another accordion, more simplified from like, it's kind of fun, interesting graphics. And then it not only has um, images, but it also has text, which is Lovely. helpful because yeah. not everybody is a sound bite. This is a cool, there, there you go for logo and a good graphic. And this was super simple. This is a um, photographer from Austria. These are simply postcards. And I mentioned I was actually able to get her in a show because I had these postcards. Um, that's her contact information right in the back. Super, super clever and yes. sizable. Like I had a, you know, I have to fly home with this stuff. There's only so much I can take. So make it workable that way. This is cool. Another showing you a graphic, pulling it out. There's the images and information on the back that says, this is only two of 15. It's like what you said, Dan, when you bring the 10 books to New York, it's nice to know you were sought to give that thing to it. That's hand right. stitched, hand bound, beautiful paper, and their images in here. Super simple, not a million, judicious. Yeah, I think you, I mean, you, you reemphasized a point we made earlier, which was you may have the big portfolio that you're sitting in front of me and we're discussing and we're looking at whatever 1114s, 1117 by prints. But when you go to leave, these leave behinds are simple, small, concise, not crazy expensive, not crazy complicated, but just well done little pieces of you that you're leaving behind. Yeah, really thoughtful. This is another one came with a cool rubber band around um, things that are just, you know, again, she mixed um, images with um, text. So those are all super important. Um, what I also wanted to um, open uh, or, or circle back with um, are questions that came before. Then I'll look at the chat. I've got new got, ones. I've um, got some in the chat ready to go, but you hit yours first. Okay, let me. Please. These are just ones that came up before that I didn't want to answer when it wasn't me on here. Um, someone, and I don't remember because I didn't take the name, said, can you mix black and white and color? Absolutely. As a curator, I do it all the time. Book design, do it all the time. Yes. And there should be a reason in your mind intentionally why. You know, some things call for black and white, some don't, and why. And sometimes it's a really hard decision but that's part of what you have to go through is those hard decisions. But yes, you can. Um, I love who um, ever brought up the idea of a live crit. I've done that online with 
groups, which is really interesting, but I have a particular way. I'm very, very specific um, about what's an impactful image and why. And, um, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I get to the point. I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm I'm not going to be rude, um, at, but I am going to be honest. And I'm not here to make you like me. Like, that's not the point. I'm here to help you hone your eye about your own work. But critique live, even if we're not talking about your work, is super helpful. Um, combining genres um, that you took, you took that on, Dan, and absolutely, I am, I am guilty of the person who Someone comes in and goes, hi, I'd like to show you my three bodies of work. And I'm like, yep, I see one body. And here it is. Boom, 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 boom. Like we get into these siloing of our works, but there's ways in which that they're really connected. Um, Kristen asked, can you combine mediums if I have installation or sculpture? Absolutely. Um, you can go on my website and look at the last curation that's up there. Um, I worked with that person over 6,000 images on one project. We ended up having an exhibition pop in while we were in the middle of just editing. And then we went full on into how to do this. We ended up with sculpture. We ended up with a room where we made furniture. We had video, we had sound. There was something really challenging and we ended up putting it in a stereographic capacity on a pedestal. Um, so that's different ways with one subject that did start with imagery and then we riffed on it in that way. But there are a lot of photographers really pushing the bounds of photography. Often it is sculptural. Um, I could give you Kai Ito, amazing work. He brings in sound, tons of sculpture, all started image based. Um, uh, there's just so many ways to present that. And I would, if you even look at what's happening in museums, they get, they're picking up on that, that people want this multimedia thread because there's not just one yeah. way to look at something. It's like, look at it in all these different ways. Um, so there's lots of ways to do that. I often have people show me installation work on an iPad. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's lots of ways to do it. And yes, yes, mixed media. Um, uh, Lucas said that he prints to sequence. Absolutely. Like, oh my God, you can't do it online. You can't. Not well. I could be so, going through so with someone. Explain what you mean by that. What I mean by that is I had someone come with about 3,000 images in a, in a body of work that was all, you know, introduced to me digitally. I could certainly do a first edit on our digital capacity. When we got down to what we were really talking about, what are we really looking at? What are some of the criteria for what makes this more impactful than that? We honed it down and then that person sent me, you know, cheapo prints this big, but then we're working with an actual print. I'm not looking for the quality of the print there. I'm looking to get to know the work and so, hands down, print your work to be able to sequence it, frankly, to be able to edit it first and then sequence it. And someone, Alex, said that they put it on the desk and it's like, great, but you don't see my whole studio. Desk and wall, desk and wall. Avedon talks about when he photographed whether it was going to be for the wall or a magazine. So your stuff on a wall, which if you could see around where I do, I've got stuff all over these walls wall and vertical and walking up to it and coming back from it is different than looking down on it. That's a Do really, both. really good point. I re that brings back a memory of the documentary film that came out a decade ago about Jim Nactway. And he was in his studio in New York tacking. He had a, a wall that was uh, magnetized and he was putting small prints up on this wall and standing back. And that became the museum show somewhere. And I never really thought about that until now because I'm primarily a put prints on the table person. I also, when we lived in California, I can't do it where I live now, but when the UPS guy or the FedEx person would come to the front door, I would have them lay, prints laid out on the floor in my living room. And I would say, hey, what, um, what order would you put those in? Totally. And, and they would just immediately get into it. They'd be like, oh, I, and they would just start mixing them around. It was really fun to get an opinion from somebody that wasn't in the field. 
Yeah. And I do, thank you for bringing that up because that makes me think of punctum practice, which is something that I encourage you to do. Take 10 of your favorite images, give them to a five-year-old, give them to your grandmother, give them to the UPS person that came to the door and say, what are the most impactful or give me five words for this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. It builds your visual vocabulary. It gives you an idea of all the ways that somebody sees. And it's, it's a whole helpful exercise in your own clarifying. Um, yeah. And I, the, in another um, exhibition on my website is called um, The Rhizome Remains. And I was working with this woman whose work was very realized. And I happened to know a gallery that I thought they would that they could have simpatico. And um, the gallery said, sure, in fact, we have a space. If you can think of another artist, you can curate both, and I did. And Rhizome Remains was this artist making these unbelievable glass plates, but she was very much thinking about this spiritual aspect of objects. And she ended up literally finding what she explained as a coven of women that would look at her imagery and send it back saying these need to be together. Wow. We literally have one spread on the wall and it's from them. <laughs> they literally had to talk about collaboration and they, you know, the artist was able to do vertical, you know, landscape versus a uh, portrait abutted next to each other. I mean, we're, we haven't even begun to talk about output. That's a whole other thing. But let me get to some of the other questions. Let me, me. I've got a couple here lined up for you. Cool. Um, this is from Alex. Sibylla, is there, a, is there a single most impactful or interesting giveaway you've seen as a photographer? I think I just gave you uh, the ones that I thought were worth grabbing. There's not just one way. It has to do with, with the, the actual subject. I'm going to grab, because I'm going to grab um, two things to show you. Hang on for my bookcase. Grab away. Well, so we got a bunch more questions here. We'll get through as many of these as we can. And I appreciate everybody for taking the time to send these in. As you can see, Sibylla has a lot going on and has a lot to offer and a lot of expertise. So this is basically a master class in, a, in an hour long program. So yeah, we are, and we're lucky it, to have her. Well, I can tell you, if, you're, if you want to know a lot more, just get on my my podcast because this is what I, I, I talk about all the time. So this is a really good example. I was introduced to this work pre-book in print form and a, and a maquette at a portfolio review. So the, the creative decisions that go into a book and end a portfolio and a leave behind are layered with the conceptual development of what the subject is. So case. And, and Sibylla, just quickly, what's a maquette? Maquette is a mock-up of a book. Okay. Um, holes, case. This is about this really amazing, um, it is, these are both inserts into the book and it, is following the illegal practice of having, I, I'm not doing my camera very well, of taking these songbirds and, and keeping them and mm. people gather. And so that's the carrying case that has the holes, the front of the book has oh, the holes. When you are walking around with your bird, you have to have it covered. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the cover on the book. So that's where I'm saying this is the concept leads the designs. Um, it's just how you take you riff on this. It's like, how do I layer that? I, I could show you how that's done in nine out of 10 books behind me. Right. Because they're taking their concept and then bringing it in layering it. I just dropped a podcast today. I think uh, Morgan Ashcombe did a beautiful job. Okay, I've got it right behind me. I can show you. Uh, so yep. he was following work that had been exposed at the Israeli border of a 
of a group of Palestinians that he had spent time with. This, he, he took the images on uh, four by five film and this was 2009. And he was like, okay, it was exposed to light. Like there's nothing there. And about 2015 or 16, he was like, what if there is something there? And he got the stuff printed and it is obviously not what it would be if it had not been exposed to light, but it's something else. Sure. This book came, it's ripped, and you can see it on my Instagram, us opening this big warning exposed film only open, you know, without a light source. And you're afraid to open the box. It came in a film box with the tape. We pushed it around. My assistant's like, you open it. I'm like, no, you open it. We were like, <laughs> or, and that was the whole idea that he animated the actual it, yeah, it brought that. your viewer into, am I going to expose something? I'm going to um, be intrusive, blah, blah, blah. That's exactly just, what happened to him. Just think about the amount of undivided attention and, and, and sort of tension itself because, you know, you saying you open it. No, I don't want to ruin it. You open it, whatever. I mean, that's the the feeling that he had when his film gets exposed to light, That it, which is an absolutely horrendous feeling, especially if you put a lot of work in on something. For him to be able to transfer that feeling to his viewers, in my opinion, the work inside the book is, an, is it, it, regardless of how good or bad it is, it's an afterthought because he made me do something I've never had to do as a viewer of a photography book. That's a that's a such a fantastic thing. Yeah. He animated the metaphor and and made you aware of complicity of of so many things just heightened heightened. It, it's got calligraphy. It's soft um, cover. The he finds out from the person he's working with who sent him a poem that's in the book in Arabic that there are so many different interpretations of the word open, and mm. open can mean open this box or open your mind. Um, all kinds of layered. This is a genius example of layered concept development. Here are some of the images. Zoop. Oh my gosh. Dyslexic. Lovely, lovely, lovely. And, and then he sandwiched it with, um, well, you can go look, HTML emails that have something else to do with the whole concept behind it. And what I want to say about this book called Open is the collaboration because book designers are awesome because that's what they're going to do too. They're going to try to layer your concept and, and, and Morgan was definitely in a collaboration with um, uh, a nonprofit organization, a poet, a calligraphic artist, a book designer. Um, so Sibylla, yeah. there's a couple questions I want to get to because I think sure. they're both, they're both really good. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can get to more, we've got about 10 minutes left. And I, Ted, Ted asks, Sibylla, how do I approach a photo review if I'm a photo essayist that includes a lot of copy in my work, which I think is pretty interesting because it seems like this person would have to verbalize more up front before they get to the work if that's what it requires to make sense. But what do you think about that? How do I approach a photo review if I'm a photo essayist that includes a lot of copy in my work? Um. You want to present your work, um, <laughs> this is gonna sound odd, but um, I was working with someone who was trying to put together for a portfolio review aspects of his book he had worked on for years that had so much data behind what he was doing, but was also photo centric. He was using photography, but many other ways of sh making this point. And what we needed to do, he had, he had interviews, he had landscapes, he had scientific aspects, he had a lot of copy. And we needed to conceptualize it like a cake and decide what is the knife edge that we're going in here with to cut out a piece. You have to lead in with something. And the root of everything that he was talking about, which had to do with gentrification and um, 
economic collapse and all this landscape or um, construction that was happening in these different countries that then stopped because of the economic collapse. He had all these layers, all these, all these layers. Guess what was at the bottom? Cement. Cement oh, is interesting. Cement is the bottom line story because of its environmental impact and it's cheap. And cement, shoop, was that was how we went in to that work. So that's what you need to do. Hone. It's like, think about it. <laughs> I'm always using analogies. Sorry, it's how I think. But in this case, it's like, you know, if you were making something and you needed to boil it down to its essence, that's what you need to do with that kind of work. What Boil it down intense aspect of it. Excellent. Um, so Talia has an interesting question here, which I think is going to apply to a lot of people, especially if you've not uh, physically presented your work in person. But she said, as a visual person, I may not be the best communicator or a verbal concept. So I hope my work speak, speaks loudly enough. Not everyone is a good salesperson. So ha if that's if you see yourself that way as not the best communicator verbally about the concept of the work, how do you compensate for that in a review? Or is that's there a great. Way, something, something you can do up front? Well, actually, so I work with people on their artist statements a lot, and that's because it is so hard to do from yourself. Like when I have to write my own bio, I'd rather like saw off my arm. That's really hard. So this idea of how to communicate, it, 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 that's super helpful to do also in a collaborative way to be able to like throw out some of your ideas. This is beforehand and see which ones stick and you kind of hone it and you can go in a portfolio review and say that, you know, like, my strength is my visual language, and I am challenged to give the conceptual development articulation. If there's any way that you could guide me in that, give me feedback in that, um, that would be really helpful. Because it's like, show up as you are. You don't have to have what you don't have. You don't have that, okay? Ask for that. And in my situation, I would say um, that's where a lot of people give you a lot of information. Like if you go on Instagram and, and find some imagery that you like in the genre that you're in or whatever, then go to some people's websites, see what they say. Um, when you're at galleries, see what they say. Just go on a gallery website. They'll say, here are all the people I'm representing. Pick two of them. Go in and see how they talk about their work. Like start to get your visual vocabulary. And, and, and what's really interesting is that the, the conceptual development comes from conversation and, it's, and it comes from yours with your work and yours with other people and yours with your process. Um, so for instance, when I mentioned to go on my website and see that multimedia exhibition, it was called Till Death Do Us Part. And the, the, the photographer had 6,000 images because she brought both her parents who one was dying and the other had just rehabbed from a stroke that were both in long-term facilities together. And at COVID, they would have been separated. So she wanted to bring them to her house and was able to do that. And she started to chronicle this experience over a year and a half. And in that year and a half, both her parents died. But what was this story in my mind? And as we talked about it, it was a love story. She saw her parents married 60 years in a way she'd never seen them before. It was a gift. It was a, that was the knife edge there. Right. So conceptually, we we came to that. It came through conversation. Um, yeah. And salesperson. Um, I don't want to be met with a salesperson. I'm not I'm not looking for anyone to sell me their work. Um, and I don't think the talking about your work is what sells it. The talking about and the concept part is just the container. It's just the thinking about your work. Yeah, and I think to what you just said is so hugely important. And Talia, I'll give you an example. The other night we were, um, my wife and I were out and we met some folks and they asked my wife what she did. And she gave an explanation. And in my head, there was something about the explanation and I'm doing this all the time with work. So over the next 24 hours, it's percolating in my mind. I waited until we were canoeing 
So my wife was like captive. She couldn't get away. And I said, you know, when you introduced yourself and your business the other night, I said, I think maybe there's a way that we can like refine that. And so I had been thinking in my head and I gave her this line and a couple of days goes by and she came in today and said, I've been working that line over in my head. I think that works. But to, to Sibylla's point, it's about the dialogue of saying, Hey, I think there's more here. Let's let me, this is how I, th I think, what do you think goes back and forth. And now she has a little bit more of a refined statement, which is it's through everything good in the creative world comes through revision and, and practice. Oh, really? So, totally. I mean, I'm, I'm painstaking to do that kind of thing, but so, so important. And when you get it, you know it. It like rings. It's like, yes. So we have time just for a couple more. I'm going to answer this one for you because I think you've already answered it, but you can add in if you want, uh, which is, do you only work with photographers? And my answer was going to be no, because you've already mentioned before working with people who do sculpture and all kinds of other projects. And then I think the last question is, which is a really good one to end on, because I'm hoping that everybody goes not only to the website, but to the podcast, which is the question is from Christian or from Kristen. What um, how do you make your decisions on who to have on the show? Uh, great question. Um, there's never enough time. <laughs> I always want to have more than I can um, because it takes a lot of time to for me to carefully read that book, think about that book, research that book, and frankly, develop the conceptual development about it. Um, so it's what grabs me. When I saw this book on a desk, um, and it was at the, the Society of Photographic Educators Conference, and it was in this box with this tape, I'm like, wait, what? And I knew I needed to get into that, that that was not a passing thing. Um, I'm really interested. I, I have my ear to the ground, and I follow... Um, people who I think are doing meaningful work. I am about trans the transformation, why I call myself a visual activist. I think that photography can transform individuals, any artwork, art making can transform the individual and us as a collective. So I'm really interested in people that are engaging actively in that level of pursuit. And it can be very, very personal, or it can be issue oriented or it can be abstraction. Um, so I, I, I have to be grabbed by the object or the, the concept. And um, I just don't have enough time to do all the books I would like to. And, and I do, um, like I attend Paris Photo. I, I go to um, a lot of art related events that, you know, and, and it's my curiosity. So um, I, 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 it's being intrigued by people. So I just want to say thank you so much for taking You're the time welcome. to do this with us. Um, I've welcome. come out of here with a multitude of things that I have made notes on and learned a lot from you. And I've known you for quite some time and I'm still still learning a lot. So as yeah. you can see below, you can find uh, Sibylla at her website, J. Sibylla Smith. You can and also sign up for my newsletter there. Do and it. my 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 podcast. So we're just if you listen to the one I did today, I'll let you know at the end that we are um, coming back out in the fall. We're going to call it concept where how you see and why it matters, because that is my framework. That's how I interview everyone. It's also the book proposal. I'm process I'm in in terms of uh, pending publication on my whole um concept development framework. And there was one other thing, just, I think on social media, I do put out a lot of information there too. I, I try to be a resource conduit. That's the whole idea. So you not only you are, uh, that and much more, you really mm -hmm. are a unique person in my experience in the field. I so appreciate you mm -hmm. taking the time to do this with us. And I appreciate Fine. everyone that signed in here from as far away as Rome. It's gotta be, you, you gotta be ready for your morning coffee by now over in Rome. If you're still here, <laughs> um, thanks to everybody for signing in here. And also thanks to Jackie and Noel behind the scenes at yes. work for feeding the questions in and keeping this thing running. 
Um, Sibylla, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, I cannot wait mm -hmm. to um, brainstorm with you and scheme with you even more. And um, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Uh, thank you so much. Likewise, I love this is this is what I do. This is my jam. So thank you. Thank you.